This program has been made by the friends and partners of Jennifer LeClaire Ministries. We hope you enjoyed today's teaching. And when we're led by the outward man, we'll never enter into the fullness of the inward life. See, we're supposed to live from the inside out. But most of us live from what we see, hear, and say. Most of us, when we're making big decisions, or even small decisions, most of us have a tendency to reason something out. Well, can I afford this? Well, just because you can afford it, honey, doesn't mean you're supposed to do it. talk today about the Holy Spirit in context of the decision making that we have to process in our lives. You know, studies show that we make over 30,000 decisions a day. Can you imagine? Most of these are subconscious. You know, you, you make a decision to brush your teeth. Or certainly you make it, you can drive home without really paying attention to where you're going. There are certain decisions that we make that are just almost autopilot. But the Holy Spirit needs to be involved in some of the larger decisions of life. You know, you don't have to ask the Holy Spirit what color shoes to wear to church today and be late because you waited on the Lord and he did not respond as quickly as you had hoped. That's being a goofy, fruity, flaky, nutty Christian who belongs on a cereal aisle somewhere. That's not what I'm talking about. We need the Holy Spirit's leading. And there's a lot of teaching on how the Holy Spirit leads you. There's lots of it out there, and I'm grateful for it. But I want to talk to you today about some of the ways the Holy Spirit does not lead you. Because we hear so much about how he leads us, and somehow we're still missing it. Somehow we're still attributing to the Holy Ghost the work of the enemy or the desires of our flesh. Somehow we just don't seem to get it right. We, we attribute to him things that he did not say or do. And I know this because people from around the world contact me on a weekly, if not a daily basis, telling me the Holy Spirit told me such and such and such and such. And I'm like, that is not the Holy Spirit. It was either the devil or it was your flesh, but it was not the Holy Ghost. And so people are making critical decisions about matters in life that have long-term consequences, and they think it's the Holy Ghost. And they only find out that it wasn't when they see the fruit and they pay the price of having been fooled and deceived. And so one way we get deceived or one way that we miss it is that we, we, become, we become hearers of the word but not doers. So when we know what the word says and then we don't do what the word says, we've already set ourselves up to misinterpret what the Holy Spirit has said. Another way is when we're just led by our flesh, led by idolatry. We're just led by what we want, what we think, and what we feel. And when we're led by the outward man, we'll never enter into the fullness of the inward life. See, we're supposed to live from the inside out. But most of us live from what we see, hear, and say. Most of us, when we're making big decisions, or even small decisions, most of us have a tendency to reason something out. Well, can I afford this? Well, just because you can afford it, honey, doesn't mean you're supposed to do it. And just because you can't afford it doesn't mean it's not the Lord's will for you. Should I sell my business or should I leave it as an inheritance for my children and my children's children? Well, your heart would say, leave it and hand it over to the kids. But maybe the Lord is saying, sell it and pay and get dividends on this to leave a larger. See, we have to understand that the Holy Spirit wants to be, he is, he wants to be, I should say he is in most of our lives. He is. He is involved. But he wants to be involved in the major decisions we make in our life. You know, how many of you are married? Okay, so you wouldn't make a major decision without consulting your spouse, right? You shouldn't. Three people said no. The rest of you are like, uh, I did that yesterday. Uh, you wouldn't make a, ser like a serious decision that was going to affect your family without consulting with your spouse. But see, every listen to me. Everything we do as Christians, as believers, affects the kingdom of God. It affects our witness. It affects potentially our joy, our peace. It may affect our love walk. The decisions that we make don't just affect us. It affects the body. The Bible says when one of us suffer, we all suffer. 
So if I do something really dumb, it could ripple down and affect you. Now, the closer you are to me, the more it affects you. But we are contending for revival. We're waiting for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe with everything in me that he could have come by now had the church done what it was supposed to do, what she was supposed to do. He is waiting on us more than we're waiting on him in many respects of life. But he wants to be involved. Someone say, I need you, Holy Ghost. He wants to be involved in the decisions of your life. He wants to be. He deserves to be. And what, you know what, you need him to be. Sometimes we think we're capable of making certain decisions without prayer, without seeking his face. But the Bible says, Jesus said, apart from me, How about that. And so where we, get, where, we, where we miss God sometimes is because we know that. You all shouted back at me. So apart from you, you can do nothing. We know that. We know that. We know that. We know that. We know that right up here in our pretty little heads. We have mentally ascended to the fact, to the truth, that we can't do anything apart from him. But then we get something. We see something. It excites us. We want it. We don't stop to ask God, should we have it? Some people have married the wrong person. Now God hates divorce. Guess what? Now you're stuck. Unless they're cheating on you or beating you up or just leave you. There are, conditional, there are conditions for divorce. In the Bible, there are three essential conditions. But God hates it anyway. So, you know, why not? Why, why marry the wrong? Why did, did, do you even ask? And so sometimes we get caught up in the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. And we just make decisions and leave him out. And we can't do that. We can't do that. We can't do that. With somebody say, I got to stop doing that. <laughs> Some people make the Holy Spirit sound unstable and erratic. How many of you have ever, have ever missed it on a really big decision? How many of the rest of you are just being dishonest with me? <laughs> Amen. We all have. I think we all have. And we, we, you know, you can miss it on little things and it, and it has little consequences. But you miss it on big things, it has big consequences. I don't miss it on the big stuff too often. But boy, when I've missed it, poof, it's been doozies. But you know what? That's how you learn. There's therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We don't need to beat ourselves up when we miss it. We just need to seek to find out how did I miss it? What in me sought to follow that, to chase after that, to buy into that, to agree to that? What was I feeling as if I was lacking that I could not get from you, Holy Ghost, who lives on the inside of you? Yes, yeah, a good word right there. I don't care where you're from. I'm preaching better than your amen in today. I don't know if y'all charismatic Pentecostal or Presbyterian this morning. When we miss it, there can be long-term consequences and expensive consequences. Moving to the wrong city. Did I ever tell you, I've told some of you, that when I, when I was released from captivity, I was falsely accused of a crime I didn't commit. They sent me to jail. They totally vindicated me, and I was released free and clear. But I had no money. No money. And so I was trying to figure out where should I go to live. My parents had got rid of my apartment. I didn't have anywhere to go. I could either live with them or I could figure out something else. I lived with them for a short time, and I couldn't figure out where to go. So I started looking on the Internet. Where should I live? Don't do that. I was just born again. I was just born again. The Internet is, Google is not, a, is not the Holy Ghost. Google is more like a genie than the Holy Ghost. I was just born again. I was looking for like the best places to live in America, the cheapest places to live in America. Well, this, this website came up, and there was one of those drop-down menus, and I hit it, and it said Alabama. And I said, oh, the Lord is telling me to move to Alabama. So I moved to Alabama, and it was there for 13 months, and I hated it. It was not the will of the Lord. However, the Lord used it. He will use it. Thank God Romans 8 and 28 is true. He works all things together for our good because we love him and because we are called according to his purposes. He used it, but guess what? You know why Alabama came up first? And I thought I was being led by the Lord. Now, when we're, mat when, we're, when we're babes in Christ, guess what? There's a lot more grace for those kind of mistakes. Once you get as old as in the Lord as some of you are, you know what? We need to stop making those mistakes. We make those mistakes when we're more mature because we've left him out of the equation. When we're younger, the Lord make those mistakes because we have not been yet taught. 
And certain things people can teach you, but certain things you just have to learn by going through them. I can teach you the theory of riding a bike, but you don't really learn it until you start riding it. It doesn't matter how much I coach you. You're not going to know really how to balance yourself until you balance yourself. How many have ever resisted God thinking it was the devil? Have you ever done that? God often leads us contrary to our flesh. Sometimes I'm like, I bind you, devil. And the Lord's like, <clears throat> you can't bind me. Sometimes it feels like the enemy. Because here's the reality of it. And this really is for a different lesson later on down the road. I'm going to begin probably later in June teaching uh, in, in ways that will bring deliverance to our hearts, inner healing to our souls. But here's the thing. The devil's trying to kill you. John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes but for to kill, steal, and destroy. But guess what? God's trying to kill you too. He's trying to kill your flesh. He's trying to get you to die daily like Paul did. He's trying to position you in a place where you walk in greater power, greater peace, greater love, greater joy, where you can be that living epistle that makes people hungry and thirsty for God so that he can use you as the ambassador that you are in greater ways that you could ever imagine. So the devil's trying to kill you, but God's also trying to kill you. And sometimes when you feel like all hell's breaking loose, you got to discern, is this the Holy Ghost leading me into the wilderness or is this the enemy trying to get me to hide in a cave? Because there is a difference. See, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. Is that what it says? And many of us don't want to believe that, that God could lead us into a barren place, that God could lead us into a desert, that God could lead us to a place that's uncomfortable for us. He does that sometimes because we get too comfortable in this thing called flesh and we begin to focus so much on the externals and we never quiet our soul long enough to hear his still small voice. And he wants sometimes to isolate us, not like the devil isolates us, but to isolate us, to, to draw us away into him. So that he can speak to us and recalibrate our hearts. When we grow up, the grace gets more narrow. John 21 verse 18. Jesus said this to Peter. Because John was like the last of the disciples to die, you know. He was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. But he, was, he outlived all of them. And Peter and John had this competition thing going, you know. When they heard Jesus rose from the dead, Peter and John ran to the tomb. And the Bible says, Peter outran John. I can just imagine the competition between them. They all wanted to sit at the right hand of Jesus. And there was this competition between them like there is. And we were surprised when there's so much competition in churches. Well, it was in the Bible. And Peter, and, 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 and John, and Peter was asking Jesus, well, what about this guy? What's going to happen to him? He said, well, if he should live forever, what's that to you? But he told Peter this. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you could say younger in the Lord, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. We don't always want to go where the Holy Spirit is leading us. Our flesh doesn't always want to go. We don't always want to make the decision that the Holy Spirit tells us this is it. We, our flesh, sometimes our soul does not immediately agree with God. Our flesh never will. But sometimes our soul really struggles because of the cost, because of the pain, because of what people are going to think of us. But we have to determine as we mature that it's less of us and more of him and really mean it, not just pray it. I'm convinced that the prayers that some of you prayed, I know for sure that the prayers that I've prayed in past seasons are now beginning to come to pass. The crazy prayers that most Christians don't want to pray. The prayer is like, oh God, just kill my flesh. Oh God, just draw me away with you. Oh God, just cause me to have eyes only for you. Oh God, would you just, Lord, remove everything from my heart that hinders love. Oh God, would you let the spirit of burning come into my heart, burn my lips with coals. You start to pray those things, then what happens is you have opportunities to trust in God more while your flesh is kicking and screaming, saying, what's happening to me? 
But if you never get to that place, if you never go to that depth in God, then you're living the shallow Christian life. And it doesn't mean that you won't go to heaven or that you won't be saved, but you're not experiencing the depth, the width, the height, and the love of God. Because when you feel like you're going to die, that is when the love of God becomes more real to you. When you feel like you can't take another step, that is when the strength of God becomes more real to you. Because that is when we become utterly dependent on him. And that is when we are willing then to follow him wherever he's going to lead. Because we realize that we have not done such a good job in leading ourselves. That we've made mistakes. That we've left him out of the decision-making equation. And at that point, we become more moldable in his hands. So sometimes, see, Paul, Paul tried to enter certain cities, and and he said the Holy Spirit prevented him. celestial beings, angels, will once again have manifested influence over the earth. The sudden increase in angelic visitations reported worldwide suggest we're entering the time, an era foretold in the book of Revelation, when during great awakening, miracles will occur, trumpets will sound, and the everlasting gospel will resound throughout the heavens. Now more than ever, believers need to understand the role that angels are set to play and discern the difference between the coming holy and unholy encounters. Now more than ever, you need Angels on Assignment again by Jennifer LeClaire. Now, this is interesting. Paul, the mighty, mighty, mighty apostle, miracles, signs, and wonders, handkerchiefs that were on his body healing the sick, and he thought that he was being led by the Holy Ghost into a certain city more than once. And the Bible says, the Holy Spirit prevented me. What does that mean? It means he wasn't being led by the the Holy Ghost. He was being led by probably what he thought he should do, good things. It was a good plan. But all of our good plans are not God plans. And his plan is the best plan. And then there were other times where Paul said, the Holy, uh, the, the, I was going to come see you, but the Holy Spirit pre- uh, prevented me. The Holy Spirit thwarted me. The Holy Spirit stopped me. So sometimes you think you're going the right way, and the Lord's saying, uh-uh. And sometimes you, you know you're going the right way, and the devil's saying, uh-uh. So you have to know when to press past what feels like resistance. Where's, what is the source of the resistance? Is it the Holy Ghost? Is it the enemy? Because otherwise you will find yourself resisting God and cooperating with the wicked one. We don't want to do that. Somebody say, I don't want to do that. So sometimes when our emotions get wrapped up in a thing, it's more difficult to discern his leading, especially when our flesh or soul doesn't like the way He is leading. But the master key, the master key. Somebody say the master key. The master, very good. The master key to being led by the Spirit with greater accuracy is total surrender. And surrender is progressive. You don't get, you know, you, I surrender all. You know, you can be singing that song. Who knows that song? I surrender all. You could be singing that song and be mad on the inside that the person next to you came to church with. So that means you haven't surrendered at all. When you, guess what? Dead people don't yell when you hit them with a rock. If you go to a graveyard and start throwing rocks, nobody's going to scream or yell or pitch a fit because they're all dead. And when we surrender, when we choose by force of our will to surrender to the Holy Spirit, we die a little more. This is why Paul said, I die daily. This is why Catherine Coleman said, I've died a thousand deaths. Because it's a process. And you should be more surrendered. You should be. You should be. Turn to your neighbor and say, you should be. 
You should be more surrendered today than you were five years ago. And if you're not, then you're heading in the wrong direction. You should, come on now, you should be walking in more power today than you were five years ago. If you're not, then you are not fully cooperating with the Spirit of grace because He wants you to rise up and be His witness in a greater and greater way that your light would shine all the more. I prophesied yesterday, and I can't remember what I prophesied, but it was about sanctification. You can go on my Instagram and watch that. I can't remember what I said, but it's up on there. And God is calling us. Listen, let me tell you something. I'm prophesying to you now. Let me tell you something. I'll wait till Kevin gets back because Kevin needs to hear this. Let me tell you something. The winds of promotion are blowing. But the winds of promotion carry certain measures of refining fire because God can't promote you until he kills you. Amen. God can't promote you until he gets something out of you that was hindering your last upgrade. That is why you haven't reached the promotion that you are looking for. I'm not talking even about job promotions. He's doing that too. I'm talking about promotions in the spirit. I've been going to London. Last time I was there, it was crazy. I turned to Prophet Vanessa and said, something has shifted. I don't know what's going on in here, but something has gone off the charts authority-wise. Amen. You should be walking in more and more authority. And if you're not, it's because of something in here. So the winds of promotion are blowing, but there's a season of deliverance coming so that God can make a divine exchange and he can get out of you the things that he doesn't want there so that he can put into you things, those uh, elements that will sustain you in the promotion. Amen. You don't want to be promoted before you're supposed to be promoted because you'll fall. You'll fall and you'll skin your little knees and you'll cry and you'll, because what you do to get somewhere, you have to keep doing to stay there. And we have to understand that the Holy Spirit is moving at Awakening House of Prayer. We have to surrender to what he's doing. And think, you know, here's the thing. I'm prophesying to you now. I don't care what happens next because revival is going to hit. And when the fire of revival hits, snakes are going to start coming out of the fire. And you'll begin to see all, all manner of people leave. All people, all new people, all new people coming that are hungry, I say, come on and bring them. Amen. Yeah. Matter of fact, if you don't want revival, you might as well go ahead and leave now. Because the, 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 the fire is going to get so hot, it'll burn. You won't like it. You'll get that religious persona. Some of you coming, I want revival. I want revival. You don't want revival. You're so religious. You wouldn't, you just run and re None of you here, those that didn't show up today that should have been here. Of course, I know all of you want revival, of course. It's those people watching online that are home in bed and you live down the street. I see you. But revival is going to break out. It's going to happen. We are on the edge of it. It has been prophesied time and time again. Just you wait and see. And then, mark my words, honey, wait and see who disappears and goes down to the Presbyterian church. And I'm not against the Presbyterian church. Amen. They're good people. But I like fiery, screaming, howling, dancing people. Amen? Yeah. Amen. The Holy Spirit doesn't lead you. Here's how he doesn't lead you. I said all that to say these, these few things. I haven't even gotten to my message yet. Somebody say, welcome back. Welcome back. Amen. The Holy Spirit doesn't lead you through control, pressure, and manipulation. That's Jezebel. That's witchcraft. The Holy Spirit doesn't, now, now, he will let your circumstances mount up around you based on the decisions that you've made, and your circumstances may pressure you. He may allow pressure, circumstantial, evidential pressure to uh, surround you that you might make a better decision, that you might cry out to him to find the way of escape, but he is not the one that is pressuring you in the same way that the enemy does. He doesn't twist your arm. He doesn't use witchcraft or used car salesman tactics. I was at a church one time some years ago. It's been well over 10 years ago now. And during this season, the man of God of the house, the set man of the house, decided that we should all begin investing in real estate. 
And so he had all this teaching on entrepreneurship and taking the kingdom and all the kingdom of God, take by force, and all these things. And so a lot of people began to invest in real estate. A lot of people. I lost $100,000 in that because I wasn't being led by the Spirit. I was being led by a manipulative apostle. Can I say that? Some of you have experiences like that. Maybe you didn't lose what I lost. Guess what? God paid it all back. Amen. Today I'm a millionaire and I have five properties and 25 acres of land. It, God pays it back because I was deceived. I thought I was being obedient. But guess what? Other people in the church went bankrupt. Others lost a lot. One of them went to jail short term. They were caught up in some kind of embezzlement scheme. They didn't do it, but they were caught up in it because there was this greed factor that was going on. And so we have to understand that sometimes the Holy, the Holy Spirit will never lead you through control. So as soon as somebody tries to pressure, you know what somebody does when, when they need an answer right now? If they can't wait till I pray, you know what my answer is? No. But I really need you to... Sorry, you'll have to wait till I have time to pray. But it's just, I'm sorry, I need to pray. And if they keep pushing me and pressuring me after I've told them the first time, then the answer is no for sure, ever, always, until the Lord says yes, because I'm not going to be pressured, manipulated, and intimidated to do anything by anyone, because God doesn't work that way. If God wanted to control us, he would just make us all robots who had a yes, 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 Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. No, but he doesn't do that. He gives us a free will. And so he doesn't want us to be robots. He wants us to be in relationships. Somebody say relationship. That apostle, was it wasn't the will of God for the church. It was him wanting the tithe off the flip. John 16, 13 says, God will lead you and guide you. But leading and guiding is different than controlling, manipulating, and browbeating. Now, if you've been in a toxic church or in an unhealthy relationship, you might not know the difference at first. We live in a digital era in which we can have friends all over the globe. Yet true, deep, personal connections are hard to come by in a busy world. And finding a church that offers prophetic revelation and practical keys to overcome the enemy's plans for your life can be difficult in a seeker-friendly church world. Enter ahop.online, an outreach of Awakening House of Prayer. We're a global community of believers passionately pursuing God's presence. We're a prophetic church where the Holy Spirit moves. We empower you to live a supernatural breakthrough lifestyle. Get connected and make true connections in the Awakening House of Prayer global family. If you can't come to our church in Florida, come to our church online. Hey guys, Jennifer LeClaire here. I'm coming to you with an exciting opportunity to partner with me as I advance the kingdom of God around the world. As many of you know, I am doing a daily prayer call that's reaching millions of people, millions and millions of people a year, but I'm also planting houses of prayers, prayer hubs, apostolic centers, and of course, raising up prophets and prophetic people. But I'm also sowing, sowing, sowing. Jennifer LeClaire Ministries sows back into at least 15 other ministries that are touching the sex trafficking industry. They're touching digging wells in Africa. They're helping uh, drug addicts rehabilitate and so, so much more. I need your partnership. When you partner with Jennifer LeClaire Ministries, whether you're in Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, here in the US, wherever you are in the world, you are helping to open a door for me to come to your nation. You are helping feed hungry people. You are helping the gospel be preached. You are helping media projects flow forth. You are helping, you are sowing, and you will reap a harvest. Listen, you cannot outgive God. I can't do what I do without faithful supporters like you. You know, Billy Graham used to say that the janitor who cleaned the bathrooms would receive the same reward as he did for standing on a platform and preaching the gospel. When you sow into our ministry, you receive a reward. I want to invite you to become an official partner. You'll receive a monthly partner resource, special seating at my events, and so much more. The most important thing is you're being partakers of advancing the kingdom of God, especially if you're a prophetic person, if you're mission-minded, if you're apostolically focused, support 
So pray. Amen. God is good and he's doing so much more than any one of us can do alone. But together we can do a lot. We can make an impact. We can have influence on a lost and dying world. It's time. It's time to rise up and go further. I'm asking you become a partner today.